wow. <laughs> Not only about sex, because that's also a wow too, but what an amazing um, group of speakers today. I'd like to just give everyone a round of applause, please. I would also, at this point, like everyone to take off their clothing. <laughs> Didn't you guys tell these guys that it was a hands-on experience today? We forgot to put that in the oh, <laughs> okay. All right, I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, I certainly don't want to be picked up for indecent exposure, and I don't want anyone here to actually be picked up for indecent exposure as well. So I am... Um, I practice holistic sex therapy, okay? Um, and what that means actually is that I, uh, I look at the origin of things, okay? Um, I don't put Band-Aids on issues. I do not usually say things to my clients like, eh, bring out a dildo, bring out a vibrator, watch some porn, and you'll get your libido back, okay? Those things certainly have a place in my office, but they are absolutely not the cure. I like to look at origin of things. So what you see on the screen here is not how you prime your pump, ladies, okay? You do not clean the toilet, sweep the floor, and eat, and go to sleep, or whatever, okay? These are actual stories that I have heard over the years in my office of what women would rather do than have um, intercourse, sexual intercourse. Um, I would rather clean the toilet. Um, I would rather sweep the floor. Um, and then one of my favorite, you know, I've heard I'd rather sleep, I'd rather eat, I'd rather, you know, do those things. But several years ago, I had a woman uh, say to me, and she wasn't my client, she was just a uh, a woman that I had actually um, had been a colleague of mine, and she had said, um, when I had asked her, I said, well, what would you, you know, rather be doing than, than having sex? And she was like, Deb, I'd rather be eating a Big Mac. And I had to sit there for a second and actually think, you know, damn, I think I'd like to, too. And I, I didn't even really eat meat at the time. Um, but, you know, I must have been hungry, and, you know, we, we do know that, you know, we do self-soothe with food, okay? So when there's some issues, um, whether it be hormonally, whether it be relationally, whatever the issues may be, we have a tendency to go to food, especially women. So not how you prime your pump, but stories of women who have um, been dealing with some pretty serious issues. So um, a, a, in a 2010 study that was published in the Journal of uh, the British Association for Urological Surgeons, um, this study was done in New Jersey, and it was with 587 women, and it was from the ages of 18 to 95. 47% of those women had lack of desire. 45% of those women had orgasm issues. 40% of those women had lack of arousal and then 36% of those women had pain issues with regards to sex. Um, I do want to say something, too, that desire was the highest in all of these age groups, except for the 18 to 31-year-olds, which orgasm issues came in first, followed by desire issues at a close 36%, okay? Now, with that being said, it's also important to mention that upwards of 30% of women of all ages have never had an orgasm. You're supposed to say, oh my God, are you serious? You may be one of them. So um, for me, that raises a lot of questions as a sex therapist and you know what the heck's going on there. Um, overall, in the United States, 43% of women have lack of desire. 10 to 15% of those women have something called hypoactive sexual desire disorder. And hypoactive sexual um, desire disorder is actually a clinical disorder that's marked by distress, um, where a woman is distressed because she doesn't want to have sex. It causes personal stress. It causes relationship stress. It also causes um, an inability to want to fantasize, okay? And all of this stuff basically causes a clinical disorder. With that being said, upwards of 15% of marriages are considered sexless marriages. Has anyone ever heard of a sexless marriage? All right, are you in one? 
show me out a number of how many times you think per year a sexless marriage has sex. Zero, twice, what else? Four. Under 10 times a year is considered a sexless marriage, okay? Now that doesn't mean that like everyone in a sexless marriage is because of a woman and she has low sexual desire, um, but again, clearly, you know, we've got a lot of question marks going on here, okay? Why is this stuff so high in women? Um, sexual dysfunction is higher in women than men. Um, so what's going on in her world? What's going on, um, you know, with her hormones, with her body and her environment? So it's sort of the why, the what, and the how. How do we fix this stuff, okay? Um, so why I'm here, I offer pro-libido lifestyle, okay? And that's one of the things that I really look at in my office is how to get the maximum out of your body, okay? Now, some of you guys may have been waiting for this uh, talk because you thought we may have been talking about dildos and vibrators and all of that kind of stuff, which, you know, hey, if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it afterwards. Um, because like I said, I, I absolutely do have a place for that. Um, but what we're going to talk about really today is that platform, okay? That platform for actually having good sexual function. So I'm the woman that's called to put the party back in the panties, if you will, okay? What does that mean? Um, you know, you know what it means. It, you know, to put the, uh, you know, little tingle back in the vagina. And at the end here, I'm going to give the fellas who are in relationships with females a little secret, okay? So we are going to get a little on the potentially inappropriate side, um, which I personally would like to get very inappropriate, but, you know, I have to, you know, to some extent obey the rules. Um, so when we look at uh, sexual desire and we look at females, we want to look at it from a balanced perspective, okay? And this is Andrew Goldstein's theory. And this basically is, is that all four of these areas have to be in balance. The physical, know, knowing your body. Now, that's kind of interesting. And I want to, you know, I was having a conversation a little bit earlier. And that conversation was about, you know, how many women don't know their bodies, all right? When I poll this at the, at the universities that I work at, um, and I ask women, how many of you uh, ladies have ever looked, took a hand mirror and looked at your vagina um, in a classroom of 30 and, and, you know, 20 some percent of them were, um, you know, or 27 of them were females because at the one university that I work for, there's a, there's a pretty big ratio there of male to female. Um, probably two of them raised their hands, okay? So, and this is something that's generally, that's taught generation after generation, okay? So mom tells, you know, grandma tell, or mom tells daughter, you know, to look at her genitals, examine it, and then daughter tells her daughter, and then daughter tells her, her daughter, and that's usually, you know, what we start seeing um, in those patterns. But so if there's a woman in, in, out there, okay, that has not taken a hand mirror and looked at her vagina, okay, that is imperative to do, all right? Because that's one of the things that has to be in balance. You have to know what your vagina looks like. You have to know what turns you on before you can damn sure tell anybody else what turns them, what, what turns you on, okay? Um, the emotional, you have to be able to allow yourself to experience pleasure. The, um, the spiritual, which is sort of this deep meaning within yourself, and then this intellectual of um, feeling useful in a life. So again, this is Andrew Goldstein's theory, um, and we can all, uh, you know, sort of think about you know, the times that we've heard in our lives how important balance is. Balance, 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 okay? There's a balance to just life in general. Um, there is a balance to sexuality. There's a balance to sexual health. Now, we're gonna go a little bit on a different path here, okay? I wanna talk just briefly about the sociocultural piece um, and, and what we see, um, you know, of the, the issues that can affect relationships, that can affect sexuality, okay? One of them is Esther Perel's work, okay? And I wanna talk just briefly about that. Expecting too much from our partners. We, and this is really sort of directly related to sexual desire and loss of sexual desire with women. We these days expect way too much from our partners, okay? We expect them to do what a village used to do years ago, all right? We expect them to be our confidant. 
We expect them to be our best friends. We expect them to help raise the kids. We expect them to be the provider. We expect them to be the sexual person in our lives. We put all of this stuff on, and her theory looks at that as a desire killer, but also looks at separateness, okay? That, that in our world today, we're up each other's asses, okay? We are enmeshed. The clinical term is enmeshed, okay? Um, and because we're so enmeshed, and because we want our partners to feel, um, or we want, our, we want to feel like our partner is, um, you know, just everything to us, we start to lose interest, okay? So in the short run, that's, that's what she um, thinks about. Relationship issues can cause desire issues. Um, anger, resentment. Resentment has got to be one of the biggest desire killers that I've ever seen in women in my office. Um, those of you who have ever felt resentment of your partner, you know one of the last things that you want to do is give them something, especially your body. Um, values, trauma, religious upbringing, um, family of origin, all of that kind of stuff affects desire. But also, if you see I have this highlighted in red, um, conversations. We're not having conversations, okay? We are not saying to our partners what we want. I like it when you lick my. I like it when you suck my. Can you do this harder because that feels really good? They're the things that aren't being said. So until those conversations begin to happen within relationships, we're going to continue to have issues, OK? And it's not just from women to men, or from women to women, for that matter. It's also from men to women, OK? So we're not having the conversations that need to be happen happening. With that being said, I just wanted to give you guys kind of a, you know, a basis, all right? Now we're going to move to my Deb's model, OK? How witty, right? Um, diet, exercise, balanced hormones, and stress management is the body platform to have sexual desire. And unless those are in order, it doesn't matter in most cases what else is happening in a woman's world. If she could have the best relationship, she could have separateness from you know, her partner, she could have these conversations, but if her body's not primed, her pump's not gonna be primed. So what is this, all right? You know, clearly um, we've got some nutrition, all right? Let's look at uh, diet, nutrition. What are you supposed to eat to prime your pump? There's, there's foods that, what I call prime the pump, and there's foods that clog the pump. Now, I'm going to start ducking here in a minute because I don't want anybody throwing anything at me when I tell you what you can't eat, all right? Because it's going to be pretty much everything that you guys are eating. Um, no refined foods, okay? You know that, right? No, no flours and sugars and that kind of stuff because it raises insulin levels. And when your insulin levels are raised, you've got low libido, okay? And that's both men and women. No processed foods, no fried foods, um, no packaged foods, no foods with pesticides in them. Um, I go as far, and think, don't think for one second that I don't practice what I preach, okay? Everything in my cabinet is organic, non-GMO'd, and clean. I don't drink, I don't even drink water out of plastic because of the xenoestrogens that are in there. And we're going to talk a little bit about hormones in a minute. And what some of this research now, currently, is finding out. So what are you supposed to eat? You're supposed to eat healthy foods. You're supposed to eat whole foods. Okay, that's why I got a picture. Whole foods. Okay, went there myself, took my own damn picture. Now, I took these pictures. Now, here's the funny thing. When we get to the end, you're going to see the dilemma I had, all right, when it came to using my own picture versus using the picture that I used, okay? So we'll recap on that. I was having a chuckle about that. So um, whole foods for clearly, you know, health benefits. I want to say this, too, with regards to, to diet. Um, recent research has actually, very recent research, um, there's, a, there's a brain chemical called serotonin. Okay, serotonin is your mood stabilizer. Everyone's heard of serotonin? Say aye. Okay. So it was thought of for many years that it was being produced by the pituitary gland. And what we found is that 
only about 5% of it roughly is being produced in the brain. Guess where the other upwards of 90% of serotonin is being produced? Right here, in your gut. So what you put into your system not only affects your overall health, not only affects your mood, but all of that stuff is directly related to your sex drive. Okay, so exercise. You've all heard exercise, right? And everybody, and you know, a lot of this stuff is, you know, you, you've heard it all before. But here's the funny thing, is that you've heard it all before, but most of us aren't doing it. And that's what causes the problem, okay? Because who the hell, now I know there's some of you out there, okay? My um, partner is one of them. Um, but who the hell wants to get up and go exercise? I mean, really, it's, it's something that most of us would rather be doing something else, all right? But I want to talk about it because it has effects on sex drive both physiologically and psychologically. Physiologically, exercise expands the blood vessels, okay? So that, or, so that blood flows down into the genitalia more freely, both males and females, all right? And what, they're, what they see with that, when your, your, you know, your blood vessels dilate, is that if it's not, we know that in males, that erectile dysfunction is the number one sign of heart disease. And what we're finding, too, is that when women can't get aroused, we're looking at heart issues now, all right? So some of the same stuff is now coming out. Um, from a psychological perspective, sexual confidence is closely related to exercise, all right? And sexual confidence and exercise all relate to body image. We know that women have body image issues more than males do, okay, at this point. So when women exercise, clearly they're going to be working on their body image stuff, which is going to be making them want to have sex more. I'm a big fan of burst training, okay? Um, burst training is going real hardcore for about two minutes, slowing down for about a minute. Um, you know, it's, it's funny because you know, one of my challenges today was that, you know, I've got about, what, 12, 15 minutes to get all this stuff in, and the last, um, the last seminar that I did on this was about eight hours, so we're going really fast here, okay? Matter of fact, so fast that we actually, in some of those seminars that I do, we actually do burst trainings, okay, so that everybody gets an idea of what the hell I'm talking about. So entertain me, and if you don't necessarily know exactly what I'm talking about, that's why Google is here, okay? Or we can talk about it afterwards. Um, so also, here's some new research, okay? So, and, and I hope that you know, some of you may scoff at this because of, you know, some of the alternating or contradicting research. So you work out at a 75% capacity. That is said to raise your testosterone levels and increase sex drive, okay, and your sexual response. You work out at 90%, you tax your adrenal glands. So you raise your cortisol levels, which are your stress hormones, and then you don't want to have sex, all right? New research, guess what that means? CrossFit, eh, sucks. Um, marathons, suck. Um, triathlons, suck. Ironman, suck. If you want to have good sex, all right? Look, stress is stress, all right? So whether it is emotional stress or whether it's physical stress, your body still reads it the same way. Clearly, there's a problem. We live in a world of extreme sports now right? I mean, that's what we're doing. There's television shows, all right, that are extreme sports, okay? What Survivor is, is sort of in that line and some of the other ones, all right? Brand new research, all right? Cutting edge stuff that is just now coming out. Um, let's talk briefly about hormonal imbalances. 70% 70 70 of women have hormonal imbalances that have low sex drive. 85% of those women have um, estrogen dominance, okay? So I'm aware that many women have low estrogen, okay, menopausal stuff. For the scope of this, we're not going there. I'm more concerned at this point with this 85% uh, estrogen dominance and what the hell is going on there, all right? And this is where we start looking at what you're putting into your system, okay, and what you're not putting into your system. There's current research now that's coming out that even says what you put on your skin, the parabens, the pesticides the, the, um, in the foods, a 
are all um, going into estrogen dominance. So what are the symptoms of estrogen dominance? PMS, irritability, brain fog, fatigue, no sex drive or low sex drive, high appetite, and estrogen dominance is in relation to progesterone, okay? So there's a huge imbalance of hormones there. So how many women in here think they got estrogen dominance? Raise their hand <laughs> or say I. Okay, so it's a big problem um, these days. Um, and, you know, so we've got the, you know, the symptoms there and what causes it. What causes estrogen dominance, we're back to stress, okay? Um, there's this adrenal estrogen access that goes on in the body that is extremely important. So when you are stressed out, um, your hormones have a tendency to rise. Your cortisol levels, your estrogen levels, um, and testosterone has a tendency to go down. Um, excess weight is a big one, all right? And this excess weight can be 10 pounds, okay? Um, soy. I have to always crack up at my college students who go to, um, you know, the, the, you know the, the coffee shop and get soy, all right, in their coffees, all right? Soy raises estrogen. So does a standard American diet. Its acronym is SAD, all right? Um, testosterone takes the biggest dive at 18 to 34. I want to just let you know that. Um, and 30, progesterone starts to die, dive. Um, your hormones of desire are estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, thyroid stimulating, TSH. It's big and it's totally undertreated in the medical community. And for that matter, only treated with a synthetic thyroid hormone. And there's so many other ways to treat it. Um, cortisol, oxytocin, all need to be in balance for good sex drive. I want to talk briefly about stress management, and I want to have you guys do something real quick. When you stress, you're doing it at the expense of other hormones. Testosterone goes down when cortisol goes up. So how many people in here think they know how to breathe? You're all doing it, clearly, right? So I guess you all do know how to breathe, but do you know how to breathe correctly? Somebody, how, how do you breathe correctly? Raise, or, or shoot it out. Huh? Belly breathing, okay? So we're taught somehow, some way, to go in through your nose, out through your stomach, and that's the way we breathe. And then when it comes to sex, we're totally shallow, because usually there's some anxiety around sex for some people, okay? Um, and, and when I'm working with people, I always have to remind them, breathe, 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 because they're sitting there like, you know, and, and this is where erectile dysfunction comes from, where arousal disorder comes from, orgasm disorders, one of the areas, desire disorders as well. So if everybody could just entertain me for a second, and let your stomach, take a breath, and let your stomach come out about 70% in your breath, and then breathe up 30%, hold for about two seconds, and then come back down. Okay, I have my clients do that five times a day, five sets, five reps, okay, to get into another habit of breathing and lowering stress. We have this pattern of inverted breathing, okay, which is very hard on the muscular skeletal system and actually changes the pH balance. Okay, so, you know, we're running out of time here, so let's get to the real heart of things, all right? I know you guys want to know what the hell's, you know, going on here. Now, here's, here's was my dilemma, all right? Now, clearly, you know, we're told that we have to use our own pictures for this event, okay? Now, I'm sitting there thinking, like, Jesus Christ, you know, how's this going to work, okay? I don't have a problem with it, but, you know, I'm sure some of you guys have a problem with it. I, you know, I'm not shy. Um, so, I, as I was thinking, and I was kind of asking people, like, yo, if I took a picture of my own clitoris, what do you think the problem would be? And everybody would be like, no, 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 don't do that, okay? So, I chose to use a sketch, all right? So, what have you heard about the clitoris? Yell it out. Center of the universe. <laughs> right, nice. <laughs> Pleasure. What else? Anything else? Huh? Say it again. Okay, so let me say this. Everything that you learned about the clitoris, just drop it now, all right? Drop it at the door. Well, actually, when you walk out of this door, forget you ever learned it's the center of the universe, okay? <laughs> we learned that through pornography. We learned that through you know, R-rated movies, that kind of stuff. We even learned that through the women who have clitorises who don't even know any damn better because that's what they heard, so they think that's the center of the universe. And then they're wondering why, when their partner's going like this, mm, all hard, they're sitting there like, oh, Jesus Christ, get freaking done, will you? 
Okay, so how do you primer pump? All right, gentlemen, this is for you if you have a, a, a female partner. Um, remember this, foreplay starts several days before a sexual experience for women, for most women. There's always outliers in everything, okay? So what does foreplay look like? You guys are gonna hate this. You, the women are gonna love it, but the, the men are gonna hate it. It looks like, honey, you look beautiful today. It looks like, can I help you with the dishes? Um, can I, you know, can I, it's acknowledgement, okay? It's connection, it's that emotional piece. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how you can actually, or that gentleman is actually how you can touch her clitoris and actually have her enjoy the touch, okay? Because remember, we learn to go directly to that center of the universe, okay? And women are notorious for faking pleasure, all right? And that's their own issue, and that's for a whole other talk of how to get women to stop doing that kind of stuff, okay? But that is something that is very, very important for men to understand. So wrapping up, um, balance, okay? It's a lifestyle balance. You, have the, you need the platform to have good sex and good desire, and that platform is good health. Health and sexuality are intimately connected. So conversations, okay, with your partner, as well as dropping the thoughts about the clitoris and having foreplay start several days before a sexual event. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a baseline of how you prime a woman's pump. The end.